Okay. Well, we plan uh, this evening, we plan on getting through the remainder of the pegging information and then into probabilities and odds and hopefully we'll end with the theory of 26 and which has to do with board position, very important. In fact, it's probably the most important part of the game of cribbage, but you can't teach it first. All of these other things come first and then at some point in your development you reach the point where board position makes all of the others fit in. Explains discard, why you discard a certain way is because of where you are on the board. How, why you peg a certain way is because of where you are on the cribbage board. If you've got good position, you'll avoid peg. Pegs are your opponent's advantage. If your position is not good, you need to, you need to go for pegs. Uh, I want to review a couple of things, maybe more, but in this chapter five, that you didn't have the paperwork last week. And the first one is a paper called, it's numbered 5-1, and it covers little turkey plays. Now, this does not seem like a big thing to most folks, but there is an advantage to faking a flush. The first one in that little turkey play is a hand that has three spades in it. And the person has led the three of diamonds. Much better lead the three of spades. If they put a bigger card on it, you can put the king of spades. You're faking a flush. You're showing two spades, three and a king. If they make the count 13, you can take the 15 with the deuce. So you're still showing two spades. The advantage is if you're holding a flush, and I begin to think that you are, it very often leads to pegs for you. It very often leads to pegs for you if you fake the flush. So if you have an opportunity to do it, do it. The three is the correct lead in that first example, little turkey plays. It just should be the three of spades. And then if you turn that over on the back, there's a couple things. I saw this hand this last week at, at club. Two aces and a nine queen. The person with the two aces and the nine queen leads the queen. You know what I would like to do? You got a nine one one. You lead the nine and hope your opponent puts a queen on it. You pair the queen then for twenty nine. You can pair any ten point card for twenty nine, but it could be the queen. Could be the queen would be the one that's played on a nine because a nine lead would encourage a queen or a king, not a ten or a jack. See? So the card you present forces the ten and the jack off the play. <laughs> Who wants to see a jack on the play? So nine, ten point card from the dealer. You make the count 29 with the queen. Most likely a goal, you'll get 30, 31 for four. If you play the queen, you'll miss all of that. In fact, your aces may be separated completely. And then the last example, really important. I see the non-dealer holding a, a triple and leading from a single. There is no advantage, no advantage for the non-dealer to save a triple unless they're deuces, threes, or fours. There are no other triples in cribbage that the non-dealer can get in back to back. Remember, we could get three deuces and a 10 if we lead the 10 and our opponent makes the count 20 because they got a double run of face cards. Then we could get our deuces in back to back because we'll make the count 22 on our second play. And that would be a go if they got all 10 point cards. The same with three threes and a nine. If we lead the nine and they put a 10 card on it, we make the count 22. If they got all 10 point cards, they say go. 
So you see, and with three fours and a nine is the only other way that the non-dealer can get a triple in back to back. And you leave the nine and you get a 19 on it and you make the four for 23 and they say go. These all work if they got all 10 point cards. If they got other cards, they won't work. But when they have all 10 point cards, it's big pegs. But those are the only triples that the non-dealer can make work. The dealer can make all triples work from aces through kings. So if you got a triple, anything other than twos, threes, and fours, there's no reason to hang on to them. Lead from that triple. That's what is shown here at the bottom of this little turkey play on the back of it. It shows three eighths and a nine, and it shows the person leading the nine. No way you can get the eights in, so lead from the triple. And lead from the triple anytime it's not twos, threes, or fours with a, with a ten or a nine, nine. On big turkey plays, there's a couple of points here. If you see the second one down there, there's a nice little double run. We hold it quite often, two, three, three, four. Even though you've heard that the four is a good lead in cribbage, from this hand it's not. And if you read on the side there, you'll see by leading the three, you see all of the cards that benefit by your leading the three. And you see if you play the four, what cards will benefit you in the pegging. It's a lot longer list if you lead the three, plus you've got the third three if it's paired. And if they pair the four, where do you go now? Okay. So. On the back of that sheet, big turkey plays. If you're looking at the number, that's 5.2 up in the corner. The third one down shows a hand with two fives and a six queen. Can you see what the advantage is there to making the count 15 rather than pairing the queen? Good chance to triple. Exactly. And you've also got the six for 31 if it says 25. Yep. <laughs> if it says go on the 25. The last one is I know this little deuce is, can be kind of dangerous in the pegging, but the hand cries out for you to lead the four for two reasons. The first reason is pretty obvious. If I pair your four on the lead, you got the seven to stay even with me. But the other thing the four does, it encourages a nine response. The nine is the most common card played on a four lead. I've got the deuce. So I cover I got for, cover both possibilities. If my four gets paired, I got the seven to stay even on the pegs. And if the, my opponent has the option of playing any card that he can on a four lead, it would be the nine. And I've got the deuce to make 15. So you've got to cover two ways there. This, the five trap we've gone through pretty heavily. Uh, the magic 11s we've covered pretty heavily. Sleeper cards, enticing the play, the jack or the rattle trap, pretty, pretty extensive coverage on those. Are there any questions on that, on that part of the pegging game? No. <laughs> We're ready to move into end of game pegging. Should have a number. No, no, not yet, not yet. We've got a little, uh, you should have a packet with, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> end the game pegging. Now, if you're looking 
look like this. I think it's 5.3 in the upper right corner. Looks like this. Big, big letters across the top, end of game pegging. Okay. If you don't know anything else about pegging, end of game pegging, hey Jim, have this one. <laughs> okay. I didn't I didn't think I had a copy and I picked that one up, so that, that makes it okay. Now, by the way, this works other places on the board, too. If you need pegs, there's a way, and you don't have to be a genius to remember this, but there's a way to recall what kinds of cards to keep for pegging. And this shows. One through five have high pegging value. Six, seven, eight, nine have moderate pegging value. Jack has low pegging value. Low because it might be the one 10 point card your opponent would keep. And the 10 queen king have no pegging value. So start for looking at the cards with no pegging value and then keep the ones from there, there down. If you can keep the cards on the lower end of the spectrum, five and below, you'll pick up a lot of pegs. Now when you're holding middle cards, don't. You want to co cover all four middle cards, usually, if you need pegs. Wouldn't you like to cover all four middle cards? If you hold a pair of sevens, what have you covered? A seven. seven or an eight. If you hold a seven and an eight, what have you covered? Six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Seven and eight. So if you hold a six and a nine, what have you covered? Six and a nine. So what's wrong with holding a six and an eight or a seven and a nine or a six and a seven and an eight and a nine? You see, all of them have got all the middle cards covered. Doesn't matter what they present, if you've got an eight and a nine, you've got two pegs on any middle card. If you've got a six and a seven, you've got two pegs on any middle card. You follow that? Whereas if you've got two, like a 7-8, seven, or a 7-7, seven, seven, or a 6-9, you're missing half the middle cards. So if you're just needing a few pegs, keep the middle cards that will cover them all. Cover all the middle cards. Now if you do nothing more than this, if you didn't learn, it, learn anything else in the pegging that we presented, the material we presented, this in itself will help you quite immensely. <coughs> One of the games I won this past week, I dealt myself three, four, six, seven, ten queen. Years ago, I would have told you, if you got two small cards, two, two big cards, two middle cards, to put the middle cards in your crib. I don't do that anymore. I've learned the value of pegging. Six, seven, three, four has a whole bunch of the small cards covered and a whole bunch of the middle cards covered. And what happens if I cut a five? Two ten pointers for the crib. I get an eight point hand out of that garbage. Now I got I start with zero. I got a hand of zero and I got a ten queen in my crib for zero. I get nineteen points out of that hand. Two pegs and Seven and nine. Or eight, eight. Anyway, anyway the total was 18 between the, the two hands. So an absolute zero hand, I got 18 points. But the pegging value often exceeds the scoring potential. Like for instance, if you think, what's the difference between a six, seven to my crib, two middle cards and a 10 queen to my crib? There's probably a point and a half difference favoring the 6-7. But the truth is that as a dealer with a 6-7-3-4, I probably gain three points on pegging. So I more than eclipse the one and a half points 
than it would have had in a crib by the additional pegging strength. So look at it from that standpoint. Sometimes if you're holding zero, the best thing you can do is not worry about the crib and keep the cards that have pegging value. And this chart will tell you which ones have pegging value. When I saw the 10 queen, they were gone, even though it was my crib. If it had been my opponents, they'd been the same too. Any questions on that? Here at the end of the game, pegging, I'm assuming that probably everybody's maybe three holes out. Maybe one four holes out, the other one three. And and you're playing offense on the pegging. You in order to win the game you've got to you gotta peg. Well you want to entice the play. Now sometimes now you're not a, not all the time are both players gonna be down there. But let's say we just pull out a little hand here that that you might be holding. Say you're the dealer. And we're going to pull one of those out of there. Now our opponent, let's just say our opponent is, is eight holes out. And we've kept a three, four, five, six. opponent is eight holes out, and they lead an eight. Now, there's a way with these cards you can peg ten. There's a way with these cards right here you can peg ten. You'll give up three. But if the lead is an eight, fourteen, your opponent will look at it, if they put a nine on it, what happened? Doesn't look good, does it? You might get a run of four. So they get to thinking, well, I better take, I better take three while I can. Middle card. So they take play the seven. Remember the eight is lead. So we put this six on it. They play the seven. So they got a run of three. And then you, the count is twenty-one with the seven, the play of the seven. We play this for 26, generally a go, 30. So you see we got a run of four, a run of five, and a go. 10 pegs, we still got a card left. 10 pegs, hopefully we're out. <laughs> hopefully we didn't need them to get out. But re recognize when you have a chance to take advantage of the cards that are played, entice the play. If I, if I play away from the eight, I'm not gonna get deadly. So, no when to play on. And that's actually, I mentioned this in Endgame, this works well other places too. If it looks like 10 pegs would be your benefit, Play this on an eight lead if you're holding these other cards. And then you go 26 after you give up the run of three with the seven. And often, very often a go. Very often a go. So you end up with the other run besides. Very, very strong, very strong hand to take advantage of the middle card lead. By the way, a six response on an eight lead or an eight response on a six lead, very often puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. A six response on an eight, and an eight response on a six. The eight response on the six really works good, because when your opponent is holding a six, nine, 10 jack, for instance, or a six with two nines in any other card, they, they lead from the six. So when you put the eight on it, what can they do about it? Squirm a lot, and they, and they generally, you generally end up getting a run 
with the, with the seven because you had the eight. Well, they got the seven also. Anyway, if we're in the end game situation and we're looking at pegging offensively, in other words, I think I can win by pegging out. It looks as though I need to. If your opponent is nine holes out, then I wouldn't break my back to try to peg out. But if your opponent is five holes out, you probably better go for it. So there's kind of a place you need to draw the line there in the end game as to where it's probably hopeless. Uh, and you just, the only possibility you have to win is to peg. Uh, sometimes that's the case. Paul Hatcher is a very defensive pegger in the end of game, and he figures if his opponent needs five, he'll go for the pegs. Uh, I'm not quite that willing. Uh, I would probably think if my opponent needed seven or eight, I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him score it. I'd like to see them get those points with the score, not with peg. But remember, we're going to get into some stuff a little later in the class today on what the average number of points is for the, the non-dealer. Uh, and my experience, and it's based on quite a few thousands of games, is that the average is nine point something. Now, the Lynn figures it's 10.2. That's why after we have the class on the Lynn's theory of 26, we're going to get into something that I call, suppose the theory of 26 is a reality of 25. And then we'll talk about why that might be the case. Good to see you, Dave. Yeah, okay. So if we're gonna peg, if we're gonna peg and end the game, if we have the lead, we want to catch your opponent off guard. So if we had a two, three, four, and an eight, we would lead the eight. The eight is a sleeper card, and it keeps our three card sequence intact. So that's, a, that's in the case of a non-dealer, you see. If the non-dealer was happy with what they had, then they would lead a three. Two, three, four, eight, they would lead a three. But if the non-dealer, let's say the dealer is setting three holes out or two holes out, and the non-dealer is five holes out, good, good, very good chance the dealer is going to peg out if I let him. So I might as well mislead him with the eight play and hope that he kept a bunch of small cards because I got three of them, and I can decide whether to play runs or pair. And sometimes down there, the best thing you can do is pair. Because most of the time if the dealer is close, he won't bother keeping a pair. You keep four different cards if you need a two peg generally, or three. You keep four different cards rather than a pair. So work the traps. You know what the traps are. Yeah, they don't work as well in the end game because your opponent is it's not predictable. When you look, there's no need to study the cards a whole lot in the end game. You really need a lot of luck. But if you apply these principles, they will work. They won't work all of the time, as, as any principle in cribbage won't work all of the time. But they'll work more often than they won't. And remember, this is a game where the national champion wins 58% of their games. Wow. That means it's losing 42%. That's pretty, pretty high loss rate. But that's how it is. That's how this game sorts out. Uh, if you're in the end game situation where you need to peg two or three and you haven't been able to get them earlier, then keep two cards of sequence or keep two cards of total a pair or two cards that total 15. So dealer has a big advantage of laying two cards down. Sometimes, very often, the dealer has two cards to lay on the table. Well, if you can score three when you lay them down, the game is over if you're three points out, even though you missed pegs earlier. 
Now, if you need six pegs to win, that's the only way you can win the game, you figure. Your opponent, your opponent is counting first and they need four. And you're six out. If you need six to win, hold a small pair and get the count over 21. You gotta get the count over 21 and have a small pair. <coughs> the other option is to work long runs. You might have a two, four, six, and a seven. I mean, it, it doesn't look like much, but you've got a string of cards there that could work into a long run. Look for the opportunity to make that work. I mentioned Delin Colbert pulls this off so often. The last play in the game is a 15 for five. This four, five, six combo is really potent. So if you have a chance to hold a four, six, pick up the five or a four, five, pick up the six or a five, six, pick up the four. That's five and the last card. Is that six? Five plus one. It was your strategy. It works quite a bit. It works quite a bit. If you need ten or more, I already showed you one of them. The three, four, five, six, and the lead was an eight. We put the six on it. We got a run of four, a run of five, and a go is ten pegs. Now, if you don't have cards that will work like that on the long run, or two runs, then you want to hold a pair of sevens or smaller. Because you need, you need to pick up, you need to close with the sevens, taking the pair and a goal, playing your third one, so you got two for the pair and six and a goal is eight, you might, you might get the 10 pegs. But the pair has to be sevens or smaller. It, can't, it won't work with eights or something bigger. So if, you, if that's the only way you've got to go, hang on to it. That was your plan, hang on to it. Don't split them. Hang on to them no matter how threatening it looks to play them. That's, that's the only way you can win the game. You need nine or 10 pegs. If you don't have any other way of, of calculating your pegging success, count the cards that will score. Holding deuce five, five, six, and a four is lead. How might that work out? Four is lead, see? put the deuce on it, and if they take the three, you got the five, you also got a six, so it might work out that you get two runs. So don't give up. If you have a strategy, don't give up on it. Stick with it. Stay after it. That's uh, kind of an interesting deal. You're holding an ace, ace, five, nine, and the pawn leads a three. Play the ace. See, the count will remain under 15, so you, you'll get a second chance to score if you play the ace. If they make the count 14, you got the ace for 15. If they put a deuce, you got the nine for 15. 
So by playing the count lower, you actually increase your chance to score. <coughs> Now, if you're just looking at defense and the game pegging and you want to play defense, you want to avoid pegs. You have first count, need four points to win. Dealer needs three pegs. Your hand, really important. One, four, four, six, seven, king. Remember, I need four to get out. Four, four, seven, king. Get rid of that lone ace. Get rid of the six. Because it's adjacent with one gap on the fours. So hold the four points enough to win. You've got the king for an escape. Four, four, seven, king. Lead the four. King is your escape card. By throwing away the six, you break up the possibility that they'll get a run. By leading to four, if they pair it, the game's over. You need four to win. The third four is six, six pegs, it's over. So, and the principle here is very important. Now, you don't have to keep just exactly the number of points that are necessary to win. But most of the time, it's smart especially if you can keep a variety of cards, a wide range of cards. There's no need to keep a dozen if you only need four. Now you might, you might be after the 24 pot in the club and you decide to keep four, four, five, six. But understand you could give up a bunch of pegs with a four, four, five, six. And Probably about the time you sit down with Bear, if you're, you got the cut. <laughs> well, the game would be over, I guess, if you get the cut, if your bonus not out. Anyway, it's a good thing to keep what you need to win, but not a whole lot more on principle. And of course, leading a card smaller than five, good idea. Leading the card under five, so they don't score a 15 on the first thing. That's good defense. Don't play hunches. If you have middle cards, if you have middle cards and it's an end game situation. Now remember we're playing defensively here playing defensively here. So if you had middle cards, say you had a six, seven, eight, you normally would lead off the top of that hand. You normally would lead the eight. But in the end game situation, you want to break the sequence. So you would lead the seven. That's especially good if you got the one. But you break the three card sequence either way. If you got the one, six, seven, eight, you take the 15 when they pair your seven. If you don't have the one, it's still good to break the sequence. Put some air between them. Even if you had a deuce. Even if you had a king with a six, seven, eight. It would be good to break the sequence in the end of game. Any place else you would probably leave the lead the eight from the end of the run because it increases your chances to score. But in end game pegging here, we're playing defense. We want to avoid the pegs. We got enough to get out on first count, and we don't want the dealer to peg out before we get the count. Uh. Now it's important whether dealing or non-dealer in end game pegging to keep enough to get out. You might be the dealer and decide to play a zero hand. You, know, you need two. It's probably, probably better to keep two. Depends how close your opponent is to going out. But 
as a rule, you want to keep enough to count out. You don't know if you're going to have anything in the crib if you're dealing. You might, but you don't know that. There's a lot of ways to have zero. So look at the board. Generally, you should hold enough to get out. As non-dealer, it's critical. You might take a chance if you're a couple holes out as dealer, figuring you're going to make it one way or the other. But as non-dealer, and if you've got a chance to hold six instead of four, and you need six to win, you better hold six. Hold enough to win, first count. And of course, it's ideal in the end game, if you're the non-dealer, to be able to lead from a small pair. If you're down there close to the out hole, <laughs> you just hope you pick up a pair of fours, a pair of threes, some, that's a very, very safe and a good position to be if you can pick up a small pair. It enhances the chances you'll win the game. I've already mentioned fake, faking a flush. Be somewhat reluctant to lead a 10 point card in the end game situation. Often dealer will hold a five, although I have to mention last week uh, I had two tens and the end game I need two and my opponent needs two. I lost the game, but I got past the first lead by leading the ten. Uh, so sometimes uh, dealer in the end game is going to keep the most favorable cards to peg and if he has a choice, there'll be small cards. He has a choice. Now sometimes he picks up a bunch of garbage and he doesn't get those ideal cards. Any questions on that? We've been through this. I wanted to mention again that pegging is very unequal. The dealer has a terrific advantage on pegging. Yeah. And I think it's time for a break. Let's take a whole eight or ten minutes and we'll get going here again. Thank you.